Today, Eric Braden is here. For 26 years, he has played Victor Newman on The Young and the Restless. Pleasure to have you here today, Eric. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me. So I just want to say, every time I go to the grocery store, Ralph's or something, there you are at the counter. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to meet you in person. And I think I read in your publicity stuff, they say you've been on the cover of more of those magazines more times than anybody or something. I should get a percentage of the sales, shouldn't I? It's <laughs> a good idea. But I also want to say, though, um, I just got back from a trip to Germany. In fact, I was in Berlin for part of the World Cup celebrations, and I read well, you the, were. Yes. So was I for the final. Yes. So I wanted to hear all about it. So you, you went for the, the, the final game then? or My wife and I went for the final. Uh -huh. And uh, we had to go to Italy before to <laughs> Had to go to friends, Italy, darn. Uh, Toscana. Boom. And um, I saw the semifinal between Germany and Italy. Uh -huh. whilst in a hotel in Florence. Uh -huh. So, needless to say, I didn't dare go out <laughs> and show my face, but um, it was very interesting. Prior to the game, a lot of ballyhoo and a lot of honking of horns, and then uh -huh. during the game, silence. Wow. Because it didn't bode too well for Italy at first. That's right. And then the silence was sort of punctuated by sirens picking up people with heart attacks. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, because of the enormous nervous tension involved. You know, for Italy, this means, for, for a soccer nation, World Cup is it. Right, yep. So then when they finally won, of course, I hoped to the very end, um, there was an enormous jubilation. Just an outpouring of just, I mean, it just, it exploded. And I sat alone with my wife in my hotel room and <laughs> the miserated together. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I saw happier times because when I, I have to admit, I'm sorry to say, but I kind of planned my trip around the World Cup. I was mm -hmm. trying to avoid it as much as possible mm. because I was going to Germany on vacation mm -hmm. and you know what, like the Olympics are a major event for, the, you know, being American, I hate, you know how the whole world mm -hmm. loves soccer except mm -hmm. for America, we're mm -hmm. out of it. A lot of Americans like it though. Well, I think it's catching on, yes. Oh, yeah. And, and I personally actually, I was, because whenever I go to Europe, I always see it on TV there, so right. I, I'd always enjoyed it. But. But I was trying to avoid the celebrations as much as possible, but you uh, couldn't in Berlin because the park, the Tiergarten, was closed yeah. off. Yeah. People everywhere. The young guys were walking around with their face painted. Everybody saying, Deutschland, Deutschland, because they had just beat, they won the first game against, mm -hmm. I forget whoever. So everybody was just mm -hmm. going crazy with mm -hmm. that. And um, It was um, arguably one of the most important events since the Second World War for Germany mm -hmm. and for the German image in, in, in the world because people saw normal people reacting happily yep. and enthusiastically and passionately rooting for their team and for their country. I actually without, felt without any of that past sure. ideological identification. So it was, a, it was a normal kind of reaction, a very humanizing effect, I think. I felt like a bit of a party pooper because being American, and I mean, I was there on vacation, I wanted to have a good time, but I couldn't participate in it in quite as much as their enthusiasm when they won as being an American. Right. So, but everybody was having such a good time. You know, but I tell you, the Americans would have, would have, there were plenty there who know about soccer mm -hmm. and who participated in the hoopla and had American, the American team won more games. Yeah. Trust me, the enthusiasm would have swapped over here. No well, the, the taxi driver on the way to my hotel actually in Berlin said, well, you know, the American team is ranked number four. And mm -hmm. I thought they are. But then I think they changed their ranking system. The rankings were we, ridiculous. Yeah. And <laughs> absolutely ludicrous. We know America is not number four in soccer. No. I think, uh, uh, however, it, it has the potential to be that, um, depending upon the coaching staff. But one thing I did learn in Germany, though, and I do want to say, though, what a beautiful country. Beautiful, beautiful country. And when Thank I told you. everybody over there, I said, I'm going to come back to America and tell everybody, go to Germany. <laughs> so I'm going to say that here now today on the record, go to Germany, a beautiful country. And I think the thing is, you know, as you said, there are so many unfortunate connotations with Germany in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. But people need to remember that that was 60 years ago. And what I thought was interesting, and I wanted to get your reaction to this, mm -hmm. I wanted to run some of my observations of Germany by you and mm -hmm. get your reaction, since you are German. Um, number one, I think Americans, well, if they don't travel as much, and I think Americans mm -hmm. probably tend not to travel as much, um, would be surprised to find how liberal Germans are. The young Germans, I think, are very left-wing. About as liberal as you can be, <laughs> and about as, about as aware of human rights I would say more so than almost any other country in the world because of the legacy of the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, in fact, too liberal in the sense mm -hmm. that the German asylum laws are so liberal and so open that people came from all over the world seeking asylum mm -hmm. 
and receiving uh, social uh, support immediately in the form of uh, wages that were equivalent to the wage of a worker in Germany. Uh -huh. They didn't have to work. They had free medical care, free education. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's an extraordinarily welcoming country in that sense, yes. and to the point where it has strained, I think, the social system to a large degree. We need to, and I think Germany has now, meanwhile, adjusted its asylum policies to other countries. And I think some of the other European nations have faced that as well. Where but not as they, none of them were as open as Germany was. Well, the other thing I learned, though, too, is just how friendly the German people are. Mm -hmm. Before I went, I hadn't studied, I, I know a bit of French and a few other languages, but I, I took a, a night class for German to try to get a few mm -hmm. words in. So I was proud of myself because I knew Guten Tag and mm -hmm. uh, Wieder Zane or Tschüss, which is mm -hmm. what they tend to say. Mm -hmm. And um, But I'll tell you this. I guess the Germans apparently thought I was German because mm -hmm. so many people came up to me. Mm -hmm. And okay, in France, like if you go into a shop, they would smile and say bonjour, mm -hmm. and I'd say bonjour. Mm -hmm. I could get by with a few words. Germany, I didn't know what in the hell they were saying. Mm -hmm. They came up to me talking so fast, I never mm -hmm. heard Guten Tag. They just mm -hmm. went into these long, complex sentences. And there would come a time I would look at them and say, I only speak English. And that was in my number one phrase the whole time in Germany was, mm -hmm. I only speak English. Mm -hmm. And I had studied German, I thought, mm -hmm. before I went there because, I, but, so the people were very friendly though mm -hmm. and very outgoing. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, English was so common there that in mm -hmm. Bavaria, I think especially, mm -hmm. but I kind of got spoiled. And I hate to say this because I really tr mm -hmm. didn't try to make an effort to learn the language. Mm -hmm. But um, when I went to other parts of Germany where they didn't automatically know English as well, I was mm -hmm. kind of like, What's wrong? I was in my, the back of my mind saying, what's wrong with you people? You need to learn English because everybody else spoke such perfect English. I, I just, I didn't even make an effort, so. I think Americans <laughs> need to equate themselves with foreign languages more. You know, the, 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 um, the fact that you, you encountered polite Germans and happy Germans and hospitable Germans uh, doesn't surprise me. Um, the legacy of the Second World War has been such in American films and on television, and I was part of that in the 60s, that you have a distorted view. And a lot of people want to hold on to that view. I've always likened stories about the Second World War and the Nazi period to a giant German carpet that other nations pick up to sweep their own racisms and their own anti-Semitisms under that carpet. And I, for one, have had it with that nonsense. Um, the Second World War has, and, and the Holocaust and the consequences thereof have been discussed nowhere more thoroughly than in Germany. Germans have really dealt with it uh, deeply and want to move on and fully aware that they have a responsibility to never forget and, but to move on nevertheless. And the rest of the world needs to and that's why the World Cup was so important. And I think people like Klinsmann, who was the German coach, and Beckenbauer, who saw to it that the German, that the World Cup came to Germany, um, we owe them um, a lot of gratitude, I must say, for having done that, for having shown the world that there's a Germany that is modern and, and uh, every bit as, as convoluted and democratic as in any other country. Yeah. So. And, and again, just even I'll just say the physical beauty of that country, the landscape, mm -hmm. the countryside. So, you know, it's the stereotypical thing with the cows in the countryside, with or the cows with the bells in the country, and mm -hmm. just every. You know, and I would hear beforehand people talking about whether the people in the north or south were nicer, whether the country was more beautiful in the north mm -hmm. or south. Mm -hmm. But I just thought the people were great everywhere, and the countryside was beautiful everywhere. The countryside, north, generally north. speaking, is is I mean more spectacularly beautiful in Bavaria, for example, in the yeah, south. No right. question about that. I come from northern Germany, and that's sort of a very bucolic. Beautiful landscapes, but it, it dawns on you more slowly. The south of Germany is spectacular, dramatic. And I, I drove all over. I went up to near, I think near your hometown. In fact, I think I took a wrong turn through your hometown because uh -huh. I went to Sult, if I'm saying it yeah, right. Yes, Sult is the island of Sult, exactly, in the North Sea. And I was impressed that you take the little train out there. That's right. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that when I got there, by the way. You have to drive your car onto the train. That's right. You can't, I thought, oh, I have the rental car, I'll just That's drive right. out there. And, uh, but on the way back, on the way to Berlin, though, I took the mm -hmm. wrong turn through, I think, the center of your town. And, uh, Kiev was bombed very heavily during the war, was flattened during the war. First four years of my life, I heard bombs and was bombed uh, every night, and then you, uh, later on, every day and night. Wow. Yeah, and that first was four years of my life. First four years mm -hmm. every night. Then after the war, you grew up with um, 
enormous destruction, obviously. And this is a strange segue, but not so strange. I was asked prior to the invasion of Iraq whether I was for or against it. Mm. I said, whether I'm for or against it is meaningless. It'll happen. But I can only tell you from my own experience, if it does happen, you better go in massively. Because the reaction of every little boy is going to be one of hostility to the conquering army. I remember as little boys, we used to take rocks, tomatoes, anything we could find to throw at English tanks. The Brits occupied northern Germany. And we had no idea, I didn't know why. It's just that foreigners had now invaded your territory. So everyone in Iraq, regardless of how well-meaning uh, Americans were, the administration was in trying to remove Saddam Hussein, it is an invasion of your home by a foreigner. Right. And that will cause an enormous amount of hostility. And for those who engineered this invasion, not to think ahead, not to realize that you better occupy the country massively, not to look for WMDs, which we all knew were bullshit, didn't exist, but to look for conventional weapons, of which there were so many. And that is what we are fighting against now. And Some other mistakes were made. Rifles in the countryside. And we'll walk next more with Eric Raiden, but first we'll take a look at him on The Young and the Restless. We'll be right back. This is all your fault. No, no, the, the doctor said... Who gives a damn what the doctor said? Look at what they have done to me. I know, darling. Don't touch me! I... You just want to be rid of me. No. I can't stand please. looking at you. Get out! Victor, please don't talk this way. I will never forgive you for this. I will never forgive you for this. Now get out. We're back with Eric Braden today from The Young and the Restless. Well, before the break, you were talking about what it was like growing up during the war mm -hmm. and, you know, being going through bombings every day. But yet I read that you admired... American films and I think American athletes and even the American soldiers apparently. So on the one hand, you were throwing stuff at the British, but I mean, what, what was that like as a little kid? What were you thinking and, and how did you get over here to America? Well, as a, kid, as a kid, you don't think, you just react, but later on as you grow older and you begin to realize why things happened, uh, then you have enormous respect for the fact that America defeated the Nazis along with the Russians, along with the Brits and uh, the French and uh, so, as you grow older, you are grateful that that happened, obviously. So, uh, every young German of my generation grew up with an enormous attraction to things American. Mm -hmm. it, it is sort of antithetical to, to a more rigid upbringing, I would like to say. It's the music alone. Is, is we used to listen to Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. Lionel Hampton, um, Elvis Presley. Um, enamored of those songs, you know, danced many a dance away with country girls to <laughs> Presley and all those rock and roll songs. And um, I remember Louis Satchmo Armstrong visiting up in Kiel and performing several times mm -hmm. and being deeply impressed by that. It's that whole culture of jazz and blues and and America. It's just it, it just. It, it conjures up visions of, of, of a kind of freedom that is cultural, that is inherent in its music alone. It's just free, it's just free flowing. It, it, is, it, is, um, it is what America is all about. And well, I was not disappointed. That, you remind me of a few conversations I had with some young Germans over there. Mm -hmm. I remember a woman um, in Lake Constance, um, which is a beautiful town, by the way, one of my favorite places in Germany. Beautiful town. And On the Bodensee. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, or I, I, I like or Lake Constance is obviously right. in English, but Bowdoin Sea in German. Right. And uh, but again, beautiful area, and Baden Baden too, mm -hmm. by the way, which I liked a lot. But she said, um, she was saying that German, there's too much sense of order. You know, I think, do you think that's true that the Germans are very big on order? She said, for instance, she said um, there could never be a revolution in Germany because mm -hmm. she said, you know, the way you say, um, 
don't walk on the grass. There's a sign that says don't walk on the grass. Well, there's well, a sign that she says is, don't. She's wrong about that. She doesn't know enough about German history because there were revolutionary attempts in Germany, the big one in 1848. So that isn't quite true. What is true is that you live in a much smaller space. Let's not forget that. America is a huge country. Not too many Americans have traveled all the way through. It's a huge sure. country. Um, you have enormous traditions in Europe. England is just as you know, rigid when it comes to that. So is France. It's not just the Germans. I would say they're more liberal now than almost anyone. And um, it doesn't hold true. It, that stereotypical notion comes from the period of the Kaiser and, and, and later on the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Because in between, there was an enormously liberal period, the Weimar Republic in the 20s. Anyway. Well, and, and today, speaking of liberal, by the way, because you're right, I mean, there is such a study in contrast, or at least uh, attitudes and perceptions, and, and what, what stands out for tourists, though, and these are some other things I want to bounce off you. Um, you know, in America, where we are shocked by, even today, by the, the Janet Jackson incident or something like that, the question about nudity on television oh, or exposure. It's a joke. In Germany, you go to the Tiergarten. I was walking down the street. This is the equivalent of Central Park in New York. And in fact, once I was coming back from Potsdam with a busload of tourists on a day trip, we go past the park. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of Germans naked in the sure. park in the middle of town. Listen, let, me, let, me <laughs> ask, let, me, let me ask you a very simple question. Are we supposed to be ashamed of how we were born? Are we supposed to be ashamed of our bodies? What sick mind comes up with that? What sick mind comes up with the notion that we need to cover our bodies at all costs and to show the body is bad? Right. What sick mind comes up with the notion that sex is bad? We are here because mom and dad felt like doing it. That's why we are here, not because of some immaculate conception. That's a joke. That is sick and perverted, that kind of thinking as far as I'm concerned. Have a healthy respect for the body, have a healthy respect for sexual attraction, for sex as such, do it in a healthy manner. Um, this, this whole notion, and I will say religious notion, and I don't care how many people react to that. As far as I'm concerned, be it in the Jewish religion, in the Muslim religion, in the Christian religion, people who want to cover up the human body, who are ashamed of it, as far as I'm concerned, need their heads examined. And don't you think that's a very big difference between a Europe and America? Of course. Europeans are very it's liberal it's, in that respect. It's, it's ludicrous. Because, you know, in New York, you would be... Makes me angry to talk You would about be that. dragged away by the police if you were naked in Central Park. <laughs> but, in, but in Germany, it's all over. And the other thing, now, I didn't actually know this before I went on vacation there, but I heard the news talking about... Um, there were crackdowns before the World Cup. Um, well, prostitution is legal, which I knew Amsterdam it was, but it, I didn't realize that in Germany it That's is. That's a different story. It is, uh, it is legalized, apparently. It is supervised and legalized. Am I for or against it? It's a different question. It's, it's um, I, I just, the, the hypocrisy involving sex, to me, is, stinks to high heaven. Well, I've always said that, at least for me, my opinion, that in America, we're more concerned about sex or nudity on TV than violence. You know, you could kill 300 people. And, and yet you would advertise care. sex more than anyone. It is all titillation. Look at most commercials. Look at most how they advertise most television shows. It's tits and ass. That's how they advertise it. It's titillation. It is saying, yes, but no. Yes, but no. It is what we call in English and in America cock teasing. If you want to know the truth, <laughs> where do they show the show? <laughs> well, well, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll take That's out a word for daytime. Right. No, but there, there really is a very different opinion uh, between Europe and America, I think. I notice that every time I go over there. And I tend to side more on the European side since I vacation over there, and I've just gotten used to it. I think, you know, Americans are shocked when they first go there, but then they. To be honest with you, I don't think we all are different. It's. it's, it's um, I just cannot stand the hypocrisy involved in that. In other words, we, we, we have a pejorative view of sex, and yet we glorify the gun, right. we glorify violence. Don't you think that is you, you don't hear people really complaining about the number of murders or something. You could kill 300 people on a TV show, nobody Every would care. single day on the news, 
the first thing you hear is how some sick mind killed some poor innocent people. That is front news. But it is scandalous if, what, well, was it Janet Jackson or whatever who yeah, yeah. exposed her breast on that show? Give me a break. This is By the way, is serious crime like that? I mean, Germany doesn't really have the problems with school shootings and things the way we do. No, they don't today. because you don't have the, the amount of guns around. That's all there's to it. The, the celebration of guns, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is another issue that um, I oppose enormously. Um, I think we have, you see, the, the, the number of hypocrisies. On the one hand, we don't want any violence in school. We don't allow kids to have normal fights with each other. Fights in school amongst kids ought to be supervised. Put big gloves on them. Have as as we did when we grew up in school in Germany. I remember. You I actually put of gloves course, on. Of course, if I had fights, yeah. no, we didn't have enough money for gloves. The the teacher would say, make, you know, there was a ring around us, mm -hmm. people watching, and I would duke it out with a kid. So you kind of got it out of your system. Yes. You didn't build it up and, and come back with a gun later. And if things got too bad, the teacher was it. That's enough. Enough said. Enough done. Here, this, it, these contradictions. On the one hand, oh no, no violence. Oh no, no, no. You can't even play tag now in schools. That's ridiculous, because it might incite some. It's nonsense. Have people who have the respect of kids on the playground supervise what goes on, but don't deprive kids of a natural need for physical contact. It's up, ridiculous. Up next, more with Eric Braden. We'll be right back. And we're back with Eric Braden today. Well, you had mentioned the war earlier in mm -hmm. Iraq. And one thing I was curious about when I, you know, what the attitudes the Germans would have, and I, I mm -hmm. certainly didn't feel any sort of backlash as an American, although Germany obviously had very strong, at least the, the former leadership had mm -hmm. strong opinions about the war. Mm -hmm. um, Let me tell you something about it, if I may. I will never for forgive Chancellor Schroeder for not showing up on ground zero after 9-11. He ran prior to that on a ticket of sort of latent anti-Americanism in the formerly East German states. I found that unforgivable. Germany owes its existence as a democracy to America. It owes the defeat of the Nazis mostly to America and to Russia. It owes the support during the Cold War to America. It owes its reunification to Bush Sr. and America. We owe America a lot. Conversely, America owes German immigrants a lot because German immigrants constitute the largest ethnic group in America, have contributed enormously to, the, to this country. So we both owe a lot to each other. To now, as Schroeder did, make political hay out of a latent kind of anti-Americanism in East, formerly East Germany, uh, amongst people who were raised with anything anti-West and anti-American, uh, to me was cheap, and I'll never forgive him for that. One thing that I, um, w w a young woman in Heidelberg told me when I was taking a tour of the university, which I hadn't heard so much about, but um, apparently Bush, in kind of response to some of Schroeder's actions at the time, well, they were concerned that they were going to close the American bases. Apparently, the America had threatened to do that. And in Heidelberg, they were very concerned because it was going to damage their economy because there are mm -hmm. big American bases over mm -hmm. there. And they actually didn't want to lose the American mm -hmm. troops. So that was one thing I'd heard, though, that they were afraid that they well, were Well, to be honest that. with you, it, it, in other words, what, what Schroeder should have said is, I may disagree with a specific uh, unilateral neoconservative preemptive uh, strike foreign policy. I may disagree with the invasion uh, uh, in Iraq. But we will it will eternally grateful to America for its unending support of Germany and the ties that exist between our two countries. They're deep, deep ties. Germans constitute the largest ethnic group in America, unknown to most Americans because of both world wars. That's the truth. Well, as, I will say I'm part German, by the way, so descendants, so I will agree with you on that. I also want to say, though, Germany, of course, now has a female chancellor. Right. In America, we're still talking about whether or not we can have a female president or if it's time, but in Germany, right. they have one. I think it is indicative of how, you know, liberal in the sense that country is. She is a very reasonable woman. Um, I wish her good luck. She is in a tough coalition, and coalition situations in Parliament usually don't produce a lot of results. 
Um, are we ready for a woman uh, president of this country? Are we ready for uh, um, um, Barack Obama, who I think is, is great, impresses me a great deal? Are we ready for Hillary Clinton? I think we are. Um, but who knows? Well, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. This is Eric Braden from The Young and the Restless. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time. All right. Well, I hope you'll come back sometime. And, uh, Gladly. I still